we are going to do a course in physics. Why physics? Because the entire world around us has so much physics. Whatever we do, whatever we take on to learn, whatever we see around us, whatever we feel, there is so much physics everywhere. When we make and get ready to make our food, the way we grow our food, the way we get the ingredients to cook our food, everything involves physics. So there is a little bit of physics everywhere. You will say, okay, if there is so much physics, why are we going to do a basic course in physics? We have the mobile phone which is nothing less than a computer. We have modes of transport which take us at high speeds. We have all the communication in the sense that the satellite tells us whether it's going to rain tomorrow or not. Then why are we still doing such a basic course? And you will also argue in your mind that if the satellites are going, if the nanotechnology is coming up, if we are developing new materials which are very, very thin and small and we are making our computers and, uh, and mobile phones thinner and thinner, getting high grade uh, cameras, if so much of physics is happening, so much of technology is happening, why are we still doing a basic course? Well, the argument for that is that you learn from basic alphabets. You do your vocabulary and then you launch forth into the world of expression, which means you would probably require to do the same for a scientific world. When you see the physics around you, you will learn the basic terms, vocabulary required to talk about small things that are happening. It is this basic knowledge which will tell you how we connect one type of physical quantity with another. And it is for this reason that we still continue a hundred year old course. That means all the laws that were determined earlier are still going to be taught to you now in this 2000 and plus year. So the reason for doing a basic course is to improve on the basic understanding so that you can use this course for better understanding and doing things with that course. Because unless you understand the basic, you cannot go forth with a higher point for it. You cannot develop on it. You cannot think on it. You cannot innovate on it. So to improve on understanding, a basic course is being taught, a basic course is being placed before you so that the vocabulary, the understanding, the connections are real for you. You get a feel of the world around you. You get the feel of what you have to do. You get the feel of what is missing around you. This will help you make new things, invent new things as has been invented over the years. And this is the reason why we are doing a basic course. So I think with these arguments, you will be happy to learn and take on this course and learn new things in a small way, but use it for bigger things. We are now going to reconsider our method of dimension and use it for some useful application. What are dimensions? The nature of a physical quantity is described by its dimensions. All the physical quantities represented by derived units can be expressed in terms of some combination of seven fundamental or base quantities. Dimensions of a physical quantity are some base units raised to power or exponents. This collectively can express the physical quantity. A square bracket, a square bracket is placed around these base units with the exponents 
giving us the idea that it is the dimension of a quantity. Physical quantities in mechanics, all the physical quantities in mechanics can be given in terms of L, M and T. L for length, M for mass and T for time. Dimensions of volume. Now, what is volume? Volume of say a cuboid will be given as length into breadth into height. So, it is basically length multiplied by another length multiplied by another length. So, length is 3 times. So, it will come as L raised to the power 3. Now, the total dimensions as expressed would be a square bracket M0 because there is no involvement of mass L3 or L cube T raised to the power of 0 again because there is no involvement of time. Dimensional formula for force. Force is the product of mass and acceleration. It can be expressed as force equal to mass into acceleration or we can write mass into length upon time square. The dimension of force is m l upon t raised to 2 or we can say m l t minus 2. Thus, the force has one dimension in mass, one dimension in length and minus 2 dimension in time. What is the meaning of minus 2 dimension of a quantity? It is the power or the exponent. So, it takes care of L upon T, L upon P square or like we have been using the units meters per second for speed, meters per second square for acceleration. So, it takes care of the second square or second. So, the exponents can have any value they can be positive or negative representing the physical quantity. Limitations of dimensional formula. Since the magnitude is not considered, we get the dimensional formula on the basis of how the physical quantity is involved. Thus a change in velocity, speed, change in speed, instantaneous speed, instantaneous velocity all will have the same dimensions. Dimensional equation. An equation obtained by equating a physical quantity with its dimensional formula is called the dimensional equation of a physical quantity. The dimensional equation are the equations which represent the dimensions of the physical quantity in terms of the base quantities. For example, the dimensional equation for volume as we had just considered would be V equal to M 0 L raised to 3 T raised to 0 and for force it would be M L T minus 2. What are we going to use all this knowledge for? What will be some of the applications of such analysis or expressing a physical quantity in this new way? What are the applications of dimensional analysis? We are going to be able to derive a dimensional formula using the definition of the physical quantity to check the correctness of a physical equation to derive a relationship between different physical quantities, some of which you may not even know very well or you may not have considered or studied in a particular course. Two rules however have to be remembered. That is that the equality will always have the same dimensions on both sides. If there is an equation which has more than one term, that each of those terms should have the same dimensional formula on both sides of the equation. 
That is to say that the dimensions of quantities on the left hand side of the equation must be equal to the dimensions of each of the terms used on the right hand side. The second rule is a physical formula or equation will be dimensionally correct if the dimensions of all the terms occurring on both sides of the equation is the same. Are we rewording it? What are we saying here? We are saying that if you have a formula or you have an equation, if you want to check it out, then on the basis of this rule, whether there is homogeneity between the dimensions on the left hand side and the right hand side, you can be sure whether you have got your equation correct or your formula correct or not. So, the principle of homogeneity has to be maintained. Let us do some problems. Problem number 1, check whether the equation is dimensionally correct. Let us consider our equation half mv square equal to mgh. Notice the left hand side has half mv square, where m is the mass of a body and v is its speed or you can say velocity. So, m v square on one side and there is a half also. On the right hand side you have m, g and h. g is acceleration due to gravity, m of course is mass and h is the height. You are connecting two quantities, one which has velocity in it and the other one which has acceleration and a certain length. How can dimensional analysis help us here? What we are going to do is abandon our half which is just a constant and check out the dimensional accuracy of this. So, you will be finding out the dimensions of the left hand side which would be for mass m L0 t0. For velocity it would be m0 l t minus 1 and because there is a square this entire dimension of velocity will have to be raised to the power of 2. So, how will it stand then? It will become m l to the power 2 t raised to the power of minus 2. On the right hand side similarly you can get the dimensions for mass as m, dimensions for acceleration as l t raised to minus 2 and for height as l and if you were to involve yourself with powers, you know you have to add them, exponents are always added when you are finding a product. You will remember you did a raised to x multiplied by b raised to y. So, you would get a b x plus y. So, the exponents are going to be added. So, would you do the same here and your right hand side will have the dimensions as m l raised to the power of 2 t raised to the power of minus 2 again. Both the sides have the same dimensions. Hence, the equation is correct. You can check other equations in a similar manner. Think about this one, s is equal to ut plus half a t square or you could consider v square is equal to u square plus 2 a s. These are some of the equations which you are used to in your earlier physics lessons. So, you can find out whether dimensionally also they are correct or not. Notice you will do nothing about the constants such as half or 2 because they do not have any dimensions. They are not physical quantities for which you require a unit for measurement. Therefore, they will not come into the picture. Now, if I wrote an equation s is equal to u t plus a t square, this is correct and s is equal to u t plus half a t square, even this would be correct. So, dimensionally you are not able to say 
whether there is a constant involved at all. But the equation is correct in terms of dimensional measurements on both sides. That is one of the limitations. Problem number 2. In this problem, we are going to have a list of equations. On one side, we will keep energy and on the other side, a combination of some physical quantities. They may be mass, they may be speed, they may be velocity. And we are going to check out some combinations whether they are going to be ok or not. So, let us see our equations. Equation 1 is k is equal to m square v raised to 3. Second one is k is equal to half m v square. Next one is k is equal to m a. After that is k is equal to 3 by 16 m u square. Then we also have k is equal to half m v square plus m a. Now, what are we going to do? The involvement in this is of energy. So, we will find out the dimensions of energy. Energy will have the dimensions say from m g h, the previous problem had m g h there. What were the dimensions that we saw for it? They were m l square t raised to the power of minus 2. Now, the quantities that are involved in the right hand side, let us list their dimensions. There is m for mass for which the dimension you know is m l 0 t 0. Then you have involvement of velocity sometimes as a cube, sometimes as a square. So, what will it be? Velocity would be distance by time. So, you can get the dimensions for it m 0 because there is no involvement of mass l t raised to the power of minus 1 for speed. So, m 0 l t raised to the power of minus 1 will be a dimension for speed. There is an involvement of a in some of the equations a standing for acceleration and what will be the dimensions for that? Acceleration is given by rate of change of velocity. So, it would be velocity divided by time. So, if we take our dimension for uh, uh, velocity as we have just seen m 0 l t raised to the power of minus 1 divide that by another time. So, it would become m 0 l t raised to the power of minus 2. Getting all this list ready, now we can plug it in each of these equations and see which of them is going to work out. The first one is dimensionally incorrect. The second one if you see the dimensions of the quantity E or energy on the left hand side is exactly the same as on the other because it is m v square and we had just calculated in our previous problem. You can check it out again. What about the last one? It has two terms. The first term is half m v square and there is an additional m a. Check out the dimensions for m a because m v square is correct. So, the first term has the same dimension on the right hand side as the left one, but the second term does not and therefore, this equation cannot be correct. So, you have a way of finding out whether a particular equation which is written or given to you or you have arrived at is correct or not by using the method of dimension. Problem number 3. Deduce a relation between physical quantities. Consider a simple pendulum having a bob attached to a string that oscillates under the action of the force of gravity. Suppose the period of oscillation of the simple pendulum depends upon its length, mass of the bob and acceleration due to gravity. Let us analyze our problem first. It is saying that you have a pendulum. A pendulum is a string with a bob and we are saying that supposing the time period, what is the time period? The time it takes for one oscillation let us say and it is saying it depends upon certain factors. Since the pendulum has only an involvement of a length of string, it has an involvement of a bob and wherever you are doing your experiment. 
So, you identify three things on which this would depend upon. So, the time you will say is depending upon the mass of the ball, the length of the string and the acceleration due to gravity at the place where this experiment is being performed. And you have to find a formula for relation between the time period, the length, the acceleration due to gravity and the mass of the ball. How are we going to use dimensional analysis to do something so different? For solution, the dimensions of time period t or the quantity l, g and m as product may be written as t is equal to k times l raised to x, g raised to y, m raised to z where k is a dimensionless constant and x, y and z are exponents. What is this style of writing and why are we writing it in this way? From problem 1 and 2, you have learned that you get the collective dimension of a quantity by using the exponents for each one of them. And you collected the powers and you said, okay, the final quantity will have a certain dimension. So, that same idea you are using over here, you are saying on the left hand side you have time and you are making it proportional to the powers of the other quantities that you have, which are your length, your acceleration due to gravity and the mass. So, the quantities L raised to the power of x, g raised to the power of y, m raised to the power of z is indicative of the collective dimension on the right hand side. So, from principle of homogeneity, you would be able to collect the dimensions on both sides, show them to be equal and find the value of x, y and z. Let us see how we do that. So, dimensions of time would be on the left hand side m0 l0 t and it would be equal to k and for length we will have m0 l t0 and we raise that to x, m0 l t raised to minus 2 raised to y would be for acceleration due to gravity and m raised to z would be m l0 t0 raised to z. Now what are we going to do? We are going to see all the exponents on the right hand side and collect them up. So, what will it be? It will be m raised to the power of z, l raised to the power of x plus y and t raised to the power of minus 2y. On equating the dimensions on both sides, you are going to get some equations. What will be the equations that you will get? And why will you get those equations? If the dimension on the right hand side is only m0 l0 t, then all the exponents that you have obtained for on the right hand side for m will be equated for the exponent of m on the left hand side. So, what do you have over there? You have x plus y to be equal to 0, then you have minus 2 y to be equal to 1 and you have z equal to 0 also. Having found the values of x, y and z using these three equations, you will find that x comes out to be half and y comes out to be minus half and z has a value of 0. How does this express the final result that we have? What you do next is that t is equal to some k times, we said it is a dimensionless, so it does not get involved in a dimensional analysis. So, k times and you have l raised to half and g raised to minus half and m raised to 0. So, if m is raised to 0, then it just disappears from the entire quantity, its value is 1. And the rest of the formula becomes t is equal to k times under root l upon g. This probably is the result which you have used in the lab also. 
or would be using in the lab for finding the time period. So, it could be that you have seen the formula before or you have never seen the formula before and yet using the method of dimensions you can find a formula which is accurate. You do not know the value for k yet, maybe experimentally or by certain other results you can put that value of k to be equal to 2 pi. For your practice you can enjoy doing this problem. The viscous force on a body falling in a fluid as given by Stokes law depends upon r the radius of the spherical body, neta the viscosity of the fluid in which it is falling, v the velocity with which it is falling and you are to find a relation between f, r, eta and v the velocity by method of dimension. From your problem 3, you now have a set method of doing it, but you have never heard of the word viscosity. That is possible. So, what will you do? How will you get its dimensions? One method is either you know its definition and you get the formula as you have learnt in the lesson or you can use a table in which all these dimensions are mentioned and use it to find an expression which relates this viscous drag to the radius of the spherical body, to the viscosity of the fluid in which it is falling and the velocity with which it is falling and get a relationship. This is exactly how Stokes had worked out his formula and it is important to realize that sometimes physical quantities may not show a relationship. Like in the case of uh, the pendulum, we thought that the pendulum time period should depend upon the mass, but when we eventually found the formula there was no mass involved in it. So, what does that mean? That there was no involvement of mass. That means, the time period does not depend upon the mass of the pendulum. So, if you had a pendulum which is very small sized bob of small mass, but same length and another pendulum with the same length with a larger mass and both these pendulums were working in a particular place, so that g is the same for both, you would get the same time period. And this result becomes important because it is giving another avenue of dealing with physical quantities. So, we have learned application of dimensional analysis to find a formula for a physical quantity to find a relation between physical quantities, to check the dimensional correctness of a formula, dimensional correctness of an equation 